Today I'd like to pick up with a discussion that we started in another video on linear equations with constant coefficients. In particular we're talking about homogeneous equations that are higher order, that are linear with constant coefficients. And so in that video we discussed if you have a second order linear equation, we make the assumption that our solution is going to look like y equals e to the mx. And the reason this works so well is once I take the first and second derivatives and plug it back into my original equation, I can factor out e to the mx and end up with this polynomial of m that's the auxiliary equation. And since e to the mx can never equal zero, solving the auxiliary equation is what will help us actually solve our differential equation. All right, so we learned then if you take a um, our auxiliary equation, that's a quadratic equation, am squared plus bm plus c equals zero. We know that from the quadratic formula, uh, m will follow this form, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. And remember, keep in mind that my solution looks like e to the mx power. So in the previous discussion, we covered cases one and two. So in this video, I'd like to cover the case three, where I have complex conjugate roots. So in other words, when I uh, solve my auxiliary equation, b squared minus 4ac, the discriminant here, is negative. So I end up with complex conjugate roots. And so m equals alpha plus or minus beta i. What do you do in that situation? So in that situation, Let's suppose m1 equals alpha plus beta i and m2 equals alpha minus beta i. Then my general solution of my equation is e to the c1 e plus beta i x power plus c2 e to the alpha minus beta i x power. All right, now we don't like this because we don't want the beta i's as exponents, right? We want real values. So we're going to make use of this wonderful equation. E to the i theta is actually cosine theta plus i sine theta. So this is one of Euler's wonderful equations that we're going to use. And so with that in mind, uh, e to the beta, or the i beta x, is actually cosine beta x plus i sine beta x. And e, e to the negative i beta x is cosine beta x. It's actually cosine negative beta x plus i sine, let me see if I can write this right, sine of negative beta x. And from the negative angle identities of trigonometry, cosine of a negative angle is the same as cosine, in this case, beta x. And for sine, it's minus i sine beta x. Okay, now the reason this is helpful is because I can, I can find particular instances of um, my general solution that will actually help me through these formulas reduce uh, to, to get a different version of our general solution that only deals with real numbers. So what I mean is, let's let uh, c1 and c2 both be 1. So if I do that, then for my general solution I get y equals e to the alpha and I'm going to break up my power there, so that's e to the alpha x times e to the beta i x, right? Because a plus exponent means uh, times e to the alpha plus beta means e to the alpha times e to the beta um, plus e to the alpha x e to the negative beta i x. Now, if I let if I let c1 be 1 and c2 be negative 1, then this time I get y equals 
e the alpha x e the beta i x minus e the alpha x e the negative beta i x. Okay, so the reason this is useful is that um, in my first equation, I can take out an e to the alpha x, and I'm left with e to the beta i x plus e to the negative beta i x. Okay, so if you remember then from my um, from my equation here, that's going to simplify to the e alpha x times what? 2 cosine beta x. And why is that? Because I have a um, from this. Okay, so if I'm adding those together, I'm going to have the cosines are going to add up to be 2 cosine b beta, and the sines are going to subtract out. Now on the other hand, for my red equation here, I get e to the alpha x times e to the beta i x minus e to the negative beta i x. And when I do that, this time the cosines subtract out and I end up with 2i sine beta x. So now I have new solutions. I have e to the alpha x 2 cosine beta x and I have e to the alpha x 2i sine beta x and those are linearly independent solutions so I can rewrite my new general solution to be y equals c1 well actually why don't we go ahead and take out an e to the alpha x since there's an e to alpha x times everything c1 cosine beta x plus c2 sine beta x and you may wonder well where are the 2 and the 2i going well remember if you have a solution then a linear multiple of that solution is also a solution. So in this case, the 2 and the 2i, in a sense, get sucked up into the C1 and C2, and we haven't lost any generality here. So this is a better way of writing my general solution as opposed to dealing with uh, complex conjugate powers of exponentials. All right, so why don't we look at an example to get an idea of how this works. So the example we have here is y cubed minus 8y equals 0. And this is definitely a higher order linear equation with constant coefficients and it's uh, homogeneous. So this satisfies what we're looking for. And we have an auxiliary equation. That's m cubed minus 8 equals 0. All right, so you might have to go dig back through some of your algebra to figure this out, but the difference of cubes, so I'll write the general a cubed minus b cubed here, factors as a minus b, a squared plus ab plus b squared. And you can double check if you distribute the a minus b across there, a lot of stuff cancels out, you end up with a cubed minus b cubed. So in this case, my auxiliary equation, I'm trying to solve for zero, I have uh, m minus two, Right, because 2 cubed is 8 times m squared plus 2m plus 4 equals 0. So I factored part of it, so I just got to worry about this quadratic, but thankfully we have the quadratic formula. And so I get uh, negative 2 plus or minus the square root of 4 minus 4 times 4 over 2. And trust me on this, or you can work through it yourself. This simplifies to be negative 1 plus or minus square root of 3i. So there are my complex conjugates. And so it's worth noting alpha here is negative 1 and beta is root 3. So then my general solution to this equation, and the fascinating thing about this is we've done the hard part. So first it's c1 e to the, neg uh, to the 2x power. And that comes from this root. I have m equals 2. That's a distinct real root. That's my case 1. So it's not a big deal. And for the rest of it, I have, um, we factor out the e to the alpha. So here's e to the negative x times c2 cosine 
beta, which is root 3, x, let me try to write that a little clearer, root 3, and make sure your x is outside the square root, plus c3 sine root 3, x. And there it is, there's my general solution. So if you can factor polynomials, these, these equations are not very difficult. Um, you might have to review some of your algebra to make sure you're doing this correctly. And if you have any questions, please let me know. I hope this is helpful, and that's the reason I'm doing this, is just to help explain how some of these differential equations work. And I appreciate you listening. Thank you.